Well, my friends, our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke in the 24th chapter, verses 28 through 35. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So the he, of course, is the risen Christ. This Jesus who appears to these two. So Jesus went in to stay with them, but they didn't recognize him on the road, if you remember. But when he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he's appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Hmm. Well, my friends, it is good to be back with you after two weeks in Maine. I am sliding in for a week. So you have me this Sunday and next Sunday, and then I'm off for three more, back with you again in September. But I am exhausted, as I've told you. A little better after two weeks in Maine, who could not be? So this week and next week, you're going to have a little bit of a treat, perhaps. Today, I'm sharing with you a story by uh, Walter Wangerin, who some of you may have heard of a a bit ago, a Lutheran pastor who's also written a lot of books and just has this really wonderful way of storytelling. And I know you had a fabulous storyteller the last two weeks and my friend Bill. Um, I hope you enjoyed him. I'm so grateful for him that he came out of retirement to come and preach for me while I was away. He's been a friend for for decades now and uh, it's really great to have him. But this morning I want to share with you this story from Walter Wangerin. How young I was at the period of my crisis, I don't remember. Young enough to crawl beneath the pews. Short enough to stand up on the pews when the congregation arose to sing hymns and still be hidden. Old enough to want to see Jesus. Young enough to believe that the mortal eye could see Jesus. I wanted to see Jesus. There was the core of my crisis. I mean, see him as eyewitnesses are able to see. His robe and his rope. His square, strong hands, the sandals at his feet, his tumble of wonderful hair, and the love in his eyes, deep love in his eyes for me. For it seemed to me in those days that everyone else in my church must be seeing him on a regular basis and that I alone was denied the sight of my Lord. They were a contented people, confident and unconcerned. I, on the other hand, I felt like a little Cain among the Christians from whom the dear Lord Jesus had chosen to hide particularly. No one seemed to tremble in the holy house of the Lord. But I... Well, the knowledge of my peculiar exile came all in a rush one Sunday when the preacher was preaching a mumbling monotone of a sermon. One sentence leapt from his mouth and seized me. We were eyewitnesses, he said. Eyewitnesses. We. I sat straight up and tuned my ear. This seemed suddenly the special ability of a people to which the preacher belonged, to be eyewitnesses. 
Who is this we? What did they see? I glanced at my mother beside me, whose expression was not one of astonishment. Evidently, eyewitnessing was familiar stuff to her. She was one of the we. I took a fast survey of the faces behind me, sleepy-eyed, dull-eyed, thoughtful-eyed, but no one's eyes were dazzled. None widened in wonder at what the preacher said. So then, they all belonged to the we. Eyewitnesses, every one of them. We, the preacher was saying, have seen the majesty of Jesus. No! I didn't say that out loud, but I thought it very loud. No, but I haven't. There was a stinging realization. I haven't seen Jesus. My eyes never were witnesses. All at once, the stained glass picture of Jesus praying wasn't enough for me. The Jesus in my Sunday school books were merely pictures and a kind of mockery. I did not doubt that the Lord Jesus was actually there in his house somewhere, but where? Even before the preacher was finished preaching, I dropped to the floor and peered through a forest of ankles, front and back and side to side, seeking Jesus, perhaps on his hands and knees. A Jesus crawling away from me in a robe and a rope. But I saw nothing unusual and earned nothing for my effort except the disapproval of my mother, who hauled me up by my shoulder, but who probably wouldn't understand my panic since she was one of the we. For the rest of the service, I saw in the faces around me some anxiety to match my anxious heart. But everyone sang the hymns with a mindless ease. I searched my memory for some dim moment when I would have seen Jesus. There was none. No, he never appeared to me. But he must be here because he's appeared to these others, right? Then why would he hide from me? And where in this temple of the Lord would he be hiding? Thus, my crisis. Sunday after Sunday, then, I looked for Jesus. I ransacked the rooms of a very large church. I acquainted myself with kitchens and closets and boiler rooms, checking for half-eaten sandwiches, a vagrant sandal, signs of the skulking Lord. One Sunday, exactly when the preacher stood chanting the liturgy at the altar, I experienced a minor revelation. It seemed to me that the bold bass voice of the chant was not the preacher's at all, whose speaking voice was rather nasal and whiny. It seemed that someone else was singing instead. For the preacher faced away from us, and the altar was as long as a man is tall. And the wooden altar, ha, was built in the shape of a monstrous coffin. Therefore, the real singer was lying inside the altar. And who else would the secret singer be but Jesus? I kept a shrewd eye on the altar for the rest of the service to be sure that he didn't escape. And after the service, 
I took my heart in my hands and I crept out into the chancel, crept right up to the altar, certain that Christ was still reclining therein, waiting in his tomb, as it were, until all the people departed. Suddenly, aha! I popped round to the back of the altar and peered inside its hollow cavity and saw not Jesus. I saw a broken chair, a very old hymnal, and dust, 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 as thick as the centuries of toil and misery. For my restless soul, there was no peace. I was not suffering a crisis of faith. Never once did I doubt the truth or the presence of Jesus. Mine was a crisis of love or perhaps of knowledge. Either the Lord had decided to avoid me particularly or else I was stupid. The only one who did not know in which room the dear Lord resided. There must be one holier then all the other rooms, one room so sacred and terrible that no one mentioned it except in whispers and deacon's meetings. Not the preacher's office, dreadful as that room was. I'd already scouted it. Not the sacristy nor the loft, for the organ pipes, nor the choir room, which smelled of human sweat. A holiest of holies. Ah, uh, all at once, I knew which room. My heart leapt into my throat for joy and fear at once. It was a room whose door I passed ever with a tingling hush whose mysterious interior I had never seen. Horrified by my own bravery, but desperate to see my Jesus, I determined to venture the door of that room and to enter. And so it came to pass that during a particular worship service, during a very long sermon, I claimed the privilege of children and left my mother in the pew and crept downstairs all by myself to the forbidden room. The only room left where Jesus could be hiding. The women's restroom. <laughs> oh, how hot. My poor face burned at my own audacity, at the danger I was daring. If the holiest place of the temple in old Jerusalem might kill an unworthy priest, how would this room of taboos receive a little boy? I swallowed and panted and sweat, but I wanted to see Jesus, so I lifted my hand and I knocked. Jesus, are you in there? So I screwed my little courage together and I sucked a breath and I pushed on the door and it actually opened. Hello, hello, Jesus. With a deep funereal gloom, I returned to my mother. With a deathly sense of finalities, I took the pew beside her. Jesus does not abide in restrooms. Mirrors are there, surrounded by lights and infused with incense, but not Jesus. Jesus was nowhere in this church for me. Walter then writes of how he sat and watched his mother go forward to the altar to receive communion one Sunday. And as she returns, oh, this was a different 
woman. My mighty mother seemed infinitely soft. And when she sat beside me and lowered her head to pray, I actually smelled the difference too. She had returned in a cloud of sweetness. I found myself sniffing closer and closer to my mother's face. Suddenly she looked up just to see my face right in front of hers. What's the matter? She whispered, and a whole bouquet of odor overwhelmed me. Mama, I breathed in wonder, what's that? She wrinkled her forehead. It's what I drank. But what is it? What's inside you? She began to flip for a hymn in the hymnal. Oh, Wally, she said casually. That's Jesus. It's Jesus inside of me. Jesus. My mother then joined the congregation in singing a hymn with a hundred verses. But I kept standing on the pew beside her and grinning and grinning at her profile. Ah, Jesus. She told me where Jesus was at. Not far from me at all, closer to me than I ever thought possible. In my mama, he'd never been hiding. I'd been looking wrong. My mighty mother was his holy temple all along. So I shocked her by throwing my arms around her neck and hugging her with the gladness of any disciple who has seen the risen Lord alive again. So she hauled my little self down to the pew beside her and commanded silliness to cease. But I didn't mind. A boy can smile as silently as the sky. And so that day there were two disciples side by side on the same pew. And one of them was grinning. In this week's gospel reading, with the disciples in Emmaus, we witness the slow awakening to the blessing that is right in front of our eyes, like little Wally in his feverish hunt for Jesus. The thing is, this blessing takes time, maybe even a lifetime of searching. It reveals itself in bits and moments across the years as we witness the very presence of Christ that holds us up, that challenges us to justice, that pushes our courage forward to be lights of hope in the world. But know this, my friends, that the blessing of a risen Christ never gives up. This blessing will always seek you out, whether or not your eyes can see it, and this blessing will gather us in until the love of it makes us all, every one of us, whole. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.